Tonight we're reciting Surah Al-Araf, the first uh, part of Surah Al-Araf. Uh, this is situated in the second half of the eighth juz. Uh, Surah Al-Araf uh, is uh, the name comes from the ayah that we just read in the last rakah. Uh, this is a station in the next line that Allah Ta'ala describes, and the Mufassirun have explained that these are people who are uh, they break even between their good deeds and bad deeds. And they are basically sitting, waiting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's judgment on this station called Al-A'raf, these high grounds. Uh, there's many interpretations of what those are, but this is the one that is uh, most commonly referred. What does Surah Al-A'raf uh, talk about? Surah Al-A'raf, by the way, the Makkan era surah. Uh, and uh, it speaks about uh, the most of this story, most of this uh, surah is stories of prophets. Stories of prophets. The first story here is of Adam alayhi salam and the beginning of creation and uh, Iblis, how he refused to make sajda to Adam. Fasajadu illa Iblis alam yakum min as-sajideen qala ma mana'aka alla tasjuda idha martum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked him, why did, why did you not do sajda when I commanded you to do so? What was his response? I am better than him. This idea of arrogance that a person sees themselves to be better than the next, a person sees themselves better than somebody else because of their race, because of their culture, because of where they come from, all of those are symptoms of this particular arrogance that Iblis uh, suffered with and that will cause his downfall. Uh, so Allah SWT describes this whole passage or this whole uh, story here. After this he has uh, four statements of Ya Bani Adam. Right? Ya Bani Adam is O oh, kids of Adam. Who, who are those? Oh, Us. <laughs> Human beings. Uh, four times Allah SWT says this in this surah. And each time he addresses or he uh, highlights something that uh, is... Uh, to be learned from that story that was just quoted and some food for thought and some things to implement for all of us. For example, here Allah SWT says, Ya Bani Adam, la yaftinannakum ash-shaytan kama akhraja abawaykum min al-jannah. Okay. Don't, O oh children of Adam, don't let Satan deceive you like he deceived your fathers. Right? Your fathers being Adam and Hawa. The, Plural there in Arabic is to include the mother and the father. So don't let him deceive you like he deceived uh, Adam and Hawa, uh, causing them to to be expelled from paradise. Uh, so don't let him deceive you now in this world, causing you to stop entering from paradise. This is the idea that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants us to take away. There is this very uh, beautiful passage uh, that describes a very gripping scene, a very epic scene from the Day of Judgment, where people are brought, people are judged, people are told to enter the fire of hell, and, uh, and people are then who are entering the fire of hell put forward their complaints and their excuses. And if no excuses, they just want out of spite someone else punished, right? For example, they say, uh, Right, when they're all in it together, the ones that were tripped up and misguided by people, they're both there together, are saying, Oh Allah, give them double the punishment. They caused us to be here. So want to blame somebody, and well, the response of Allah is very interesting. Everybody's going to have a multiplication of punishment. You can't blame anybody else but yourself, for this situation that you find yourselves to be in. This is the idea, the Qur'an makes it very clear. There's levels of accountability. We'll come to the idea of fitrah later in the surah. I think maybe the day after tomorrow, uh, or tomorrow, I don't remember exactly where it is right now. Uh, but the idea of accountability is built upon the idea of the fitrah that Allah has created us upon. And every single person has that baseline. And then after this, it depends on circumstances. The people who saw the Prophet have a higher level of accountability than the people who didn't see him. Okay? Because the evidence was so clearly established. But everybody has a baseline level of accountability, and you can be blaming others 
for your misguidance. This is what the surah makes a very clear point about. Uh, then continues to speak about uh, briefly uh, the different uh, prophets, beginning with Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salam, then uh, Hud alayhi salam. Every time the story begins, it's always like this. Uh, the first one begins, Laqad arsalna Nuhan, we have sent, surely we have sent Noah. And then after that, every subsequent prophet is mentioned like this. Huda. To Ad, we send their brother Hud. Wa ila Madiana Akahum Shuaiba. To uh, Midian, we send their brother Shuaib. And so on and so on. Wa ila Thamud Akahum Saliha. To Thamud, we send their brother uh, uh, Salih. Uh, so, this is the style of how the Quran speaks about the prophets. Uh, two quick points. Uh, the stories are very beautiful. I've given like some, uh, you know, le lessons about the story of Shuaib alayhi salam. The lesson was like five hours long, so I don't think I want to <laughs> get into that. But the uh, interesting two quick things about this. One is how Allah says, "Wa ila Thamuda aqahum Saliha, wa ila Madiana aqahum Shuaiba." Their brother Salih, their brother Shuaib, their brother Hud. This is a very important principle that these people were sent to their nations and they were brothers in humanity and on that basis they could call them to to Islam to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they have to be brothers in humanity you know there's a shared element before any da'wah could be done and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points this out very very subtly here the last point is a linguistic benefit which is uh, if you uh, the passage about the uh, fire of hell and the day of judgment Right? That passage from ayah number 38 to ayah number uh, 50. The whole passage is talking about what's happening in the, on the Day of Judgment and the people of Hellfire, people of the Paradise speaking to the people of Hellfire and so on and so forth. The entire passage is in the past tense. Hmm? It's in the past tense. But the event is when? In the future, right? It hasn't happened yet, has it? Of course not, we're still alive, alhamdulillah. Uh, it hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen in the future. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about it in the past tense. قَالَ دْخُلُوا فِي أُمَمٍ He said, enter into, uh, enter into hellfire. Whereas the actual meaning is, he is going to say, enter into hellfire. وَنَادَ أَصْحَابُ الْجَنَّةِ أَصْحَابَ النَّارِ The people of the paradise called out to, that's what the literal thing is, but actually is, they are calling out or they will call out to the people of fire. Uh, they said yes. In reality, they will say yes. Why is this? The, one of the reasons that the scholars mention about this is because the past is certain, right? It's already happened. Yes or no? Done deal. No debates about it. Am I right? Just as certain we are of the past, we need to be just as certain of the future of the afterlife. To be that convinced that just like the past has already happened, as we know that for a fact, we need to know for a fact that the resurrection will happen, the judgment will happen, paradise and hellfire are also going to happen. And that conviction comes very subtly from this beautiful Quranic expression of using the past tense to describe the, the future. So we ask Allah to give us the to the for our sunnah and to keep in our lives. Just one quick thing, and before I wrap up, just announcement logistically. Tomorrow we have a big iftar here. MashaAllah, Allah is uh, sponsoring that, Jazawallah khairan. So we need some brothers uh, to help us set up the tables and chairs. If you can kindly spend five or ten minutes doing so, Allah uh, will be very happy and make dua for you, inshaAllah.